Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jeff Holstrom, president of the Green Mountain Audubon Society. We're a chapter of the National Audubon Society covering Franklin, Grand Isle, and Chittenden counties. If you receive this Audubon magazine and live in one of those counties, you're most likely a member of Green Mountain Audubon Society, so thank you. If you're not uh, a member and you're interested in joining, uh, I pasted the link uh, to our web page on membership. Um, it enables you to get some more information and join the chapter again if you're interested. Our chapter is located in northwestern Vermont, a place which has been sacred to indigenous people for thousands of years. The Western Abnaki are the traditional caretakers of these lands and waters. We respect their connection to this region and we remember the hardships which they continue to endure. We give thanks for the opportunity to share this place and to work to protect it. And with that, I will hand it over to my fellow board member and our master of ceremonies for this evening, Tom Jimicello. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you everybody for signing in. Tonight we have a really nice program. It is the second of a series of four programs that MAV is doing for us this winter after having done a series of four programs last winter. Um, we actually have a program next Thursday. It's going to be by Doug Morin. And if you'd like to see what our events are coming up, and we have quite a few, go simply to the link that Jeff has pasted in the chat. It's greenmountainaudubon, one word, dot org. And you can click on the nav bar at top and see the events. Tonight's presenter is a friend of mine and a mentor of mine. I called her up in 2008 and said, I want to be a birder. And for the next couple of months, she took me in her car down through Addison and uh, Chittenden, and I had no idea where I was. And then I finally started to orient myself. And here I am 12 years later, still enjoying everything I can learn about birds and birding. Mav is a published author with two novels to her credit. She's also written articles for birding magazines, as well as having a loyal following in the Ollie classes. And she actually also teaches classes at uh, Champlain Valley. So tonight our topic is the birds and the bees in Birdland, part one, sexual differences and similarities, courtship and mating. So Mav, it sounds intriguing. Take it away. Thank you. And we'll stop at the end of part one for questions or comments and then see part two. They're both about uh, 25 minutes maybe. So this program actually started way back in the early 70s. We had a bird feeder right outside our kitchen window where we lived in Essex Junction. And one morning I went into the kitchen and I found my younger daughter kneeling on the kitchen floor with her nose against the glass, staring into the bird feeder. And she was cooing, are you a mommy bird or a daddy bird? What about you, little bird? Are you a mommy or a daddy? <laughs> and it was a good question because like almost every other vertebrate life form on earth and many invertebrates, birds do come in mommies and daddies. This pair of loons that I saw in Caspian Lake in Greensboro was probably a mated male and female because it was uh, the beginning of breeding season but they could have been two adults that didn't breed that year. We humans can't always tell because often avian mommies and daddies look almost identical to us. Sometimes though we can tell. Sometimes there are dramatic differences. Sometimes there are really subtle differences, but still discernible to human eyes. Many species of birds exhibit something that's called sexual dimorphism. That means the males and the females differ either a lot or just a little. And they can differ in either size or color or both. Let's talk about size differences first. In a whoops, I went too fast there. In a lot of species of birds, <clears throat> And in most, as in most species of animals, males are bigger and they're heavier than females. And that makes sense sort of because the males of many species compete for females 
compete for territory, compete for the right to mate, and they can end up having physical confrontations and size and strength matter. However, in most owls and falcons and hawks, like this beautiful rough-legged hawk, males are considerably smaller than females. This female Cooper's hawk, looking for a tasty morning dove uh, at our feeders one morning, was close to 20 inches long. Well, her mate could have been as many as five inches shorter in length and a lot lighter in weight. In sharp-shinned hawks, uh, close relatives of Cooper's, the males are a little bigger than blue jays, maybe 10, 12 inches or so, and the females can be almost 18 inches long. Well, that can make for tricky IDing because sharp shin and Cooper's hawks live very, look very similar. As a matter of fact, looking at this, I'm not entirely sure whether this is a sharp shin hawk or a male Cooper's, so I'd like some feedback later. Um, and the size differences don't help us humans because a really big female sharp shin, which is a smaller species, can actually be bigger than a diminutive male Cooper's. Well, decades of research have not come up with any consensus about why these specific kinds of birds, raptors, or birds that, prey on li that eat live prey, should be different from most other animals. Why the females are consistently both heavier and larger. People have suggested that larger females can defend their young against raccoons and crows, um, maybe against other raptors. They might also be more comfortable sitting for long hours on a nest um, than if they were smaller and bonier. And their large bodies can provide more warmth, but that's true of songbirds too. And in songbirds, the females aren't bigger. Well, with raptors, the relatively smaller and sleeker male spending most of his time hunting for food for his mate and his offspring can focus on smaller prey, which is actually easier to come by. And his compact size and maneuverability will help him bring home a lot more food. So that may be the reason. Now, some raptors, a lot of raptors, differ in color as well as size. There's a beautiful year-round hawk here in Vermont called the Northern Harrier. And the females, well, the, the color differences here are huge, bigger for us, our eyes than size differences even. Female harriers are many different colors of brown and tan and rich russet. And the males are all silvery or gray. Birders call them gray ghosts. And when combined with significant size difference, the difference in color between the two sexes of the same species makes them look like they might be two entirely different species. These two photos, by the way, the two Harrier photos were um, sent to me by someone named Mark Bierman, a fellow birder whom I have never met, and yet he graciously offered these two photos. In other raptors, the differences are more subtle. American kestrels, they're just lovely, lovely little, um, ra little falcons. <clears throat> they're smaller cousins of the powerful peregrine falcons. And adult male kestrels are rusty above, pale, sandy, and white with blotches below, with slate blue wings. Both sexes have multicolored heads. Jeez, I have a very, I have a brand new mouse and it's very sensitive. Both sexes have uh, multicolored heads, but the slightly larger females are mostly shades of rust and brown and gray and tan on the wings and the back and the belly and the breast. Gender differences are even more subtle in ospreys. In fact, the two sexes look really alike, but females, like this mother, <laughs> fiercely defending her nest, have a bit more brown in their plumage and very often the brown makes a kind of necklace in front. I just love this picture. You just know this bird is ready to take on all comers. For other raptors, there's no color difference that we can detect. When we are lucky enough to see an adult bald eagle soaring overhead or sitting on a rock like this haughty creature, its white head and white tail gleaming in the sun, 
there's no way we can tell whether we're looking at a male or a female. So this is quite a range of possibilities from dramatic differences to subtle differences to none at all. And that occurs in many bird species other than raptors, bird species that don't have big size differences. Cardinals are just a great example of sexual dimorphism that's obvious instantly to us humans. The males are brilliant red from their tails all the way to the top of their crest with black masks. And the females are this light, beautiful brownish orange with some red only in the wings and the tail and the top of the head. And red-winged blackbird males, just like their name says, they are red-winged and they are black. And that makes sense. But the females are also called red-winged blackbirds and they're mostly shades of brown. That yellow or orange wash under the, around the bill, under the bill actually, is their only other color. Often birds were named for the breeding males. So the names really don't at all describe females or males in non-breeding plumage or young birds, first year birds. This can make identification somewhat difficult for, for new birders. In brown-headed cowbirds, it's the females, excuse me, it's the males that have that brown head. Females, like this poor little lady shivering in a late March blizzard, are overall sort of, sort of taupe colored. In rose-breasted grosbeaks, it's the breeding males that get that gorgeous rose breast. The females have the gross beak, that huge seed cracking beak, but not even a tiny hint of rose. And only male purple finches are purple. The bird that Roger Torrey Peterson said look like a sparrow dipped in raspberry juice. <clears throat> the females are brown, and that same dichotomy is evident in their close relatives, house finches. More colorful males, like this one, and very subtly colored females, like this one. I really think this picture is just a great example of how truly beautiful the, the gentle, subtle colors can be. Only male ruby-throated hummingbirds have the ruby throat. The females are lovely little birds though, with their green and bronze and copper highlights, but their throats are white, not ruby colored. Only male scarlet tanagers are scarlet. My partner Bernie took this picture of a resplendent male carrying food to the nest at the wonderful Shalott Park and Wildlife Refuge one of our favorite places to walk and look for birds. And right nearby was the female. Tanagers are really devoted partners during the nesting season. And so if you're lucky, you often can get a chance of seeing the male and the female together. Yellow, like this female, by the way, seems to be the color of choice for female tanagers in many parts of the country. And uh, we saw this hepatic tanager female in southeastern Arizona, and she looks quite a lot like her northern cousin. Sometimes sexual dimorphism is so dramatic that even ornithologists don't recognize that the two sexes are the same species. Black-throated blue warbler males are blue, and they do have black throats, as their name indicates, but the females aren't blue and they don't have black throats. In fact, they look so different that the two sexes were believed to be two separate species until well into the 20th century. <clears throat> Most kinds of ducks also show um, quite a bit of sexual dimorphism and significant plumage differences. We're all familiar with mallards. These are four mallard males and one mallard female. The males have glossy gleaming heads, iridescent really. Sometimes their heads are actually green, but they can appear reddish or even purple depending on the light. And the females are always dressed in quiet brown and tan. 
And that same pattern is evident in a lot of other ducks, showy drakes like this handsome common merganser and really quiet colored females. Sexual dimorphism having to do with color is a really handy evolutionary device. A female's quiet colors provide camouflage while she's sitting on the nest. While the male's bright plumage, well, one, it attracts the females, but also they can um, distract predators, sort of attract predators away from um, vulnerable nesting female, vulnerable eggs, or vulnerable young. Male ducks and male game birds, like this fabulous looking turkey, <laughs> um, are highly visible targets for four-legged predators like foxes or coyotes. And they're also highly visible targets for human hunters. Here's another just gorgeous male distraction. This beautiful cock pheasant, by the way, was strolling right across a field in Addison County. This is not a usual sight. Around the world, male birds have evolved extravagant plumage for the purpose of catching the attention of females and for distracting predators. The courtship plumage of jungle birds, I think we've all seen pictures of those, they boggle the eyes. And it makes sense in an environment where sound is muted by billions and billions of leaves and often further muted and darkened by rain and dense foliage, the male birds have to be either exceptionally bright to be noticed or exceptionally loud. Here in the north, our forest birds, most of our forest birds aren't exceptionally bright colored, but they do rely on beautiful, beautiful song to attract a mate. Male wood thrushes are one of the first singing birds to be heard on spring mornings and one of the last to be heard as night falls. The male uses his song to establish his territory and the sweet, high, pure song is easily heard from every corner of the few acres that he calls his. This feisty little bird is a red-eyed vireo nipping at Mark Labar's hand um, during a bird banding demonstration at the Audubon Center in Huntington. Vireos are smallish songbirds, as you can see. They're bigger than hummingbirds and bigger than most warblers, but they're smaller than robins and blackbirds, etc. And in the vireo family, as for thrushes, a male's song announces his territory, and it's the territory that attracts a female. Male vireos move from treetop to treetop all around their territory, all around the periphery, constantly announcing, this is mine. And females hear that constant singing and they come closer to check out the territory. They look for vital features like nest sites, nest materials, available food, good places to take cover. And the females also check out the territory for any potential danger, such as wandering cats. Most vireos have no sexual dimorphism that we can see anyway. All warbling vireos um, are quiet colored little birds. Sorry, this picture is blurry. I love it. I use it a lot because this little female was just sitting on her absolutely beautifully woven nest at Beacon River Shore Preserve just outside of Richmond. So they're quiet looking birds, but the males are anything but quiet during breeding time. They spend most of every single day, as do red-eyed vireos, patrolling their territories, defending their territories, and singing. Well, the sexes look alike in, like in egrets and herons also. Those are both long-legged wading birds that breed in wetlands. Many of them are big and showy and beautiful with adult males and adult females looking pretty much the same to, same to us. This is a snowy egret, a species that isn't seen very often in Vermont. But gray egrets have become quite common in our state. Adult gray egrets like this one, um, standing next to the much smaller snowy egret, 
grow long plumes on their backs during breeding season. And males carefully build nesting platforms from sticks and twigs. And once the platform is finished, the male goes looking for a female to attract. And when he sees a female, he uses his beautiful plumes in displays like this. These birds stamp their feet, they shake their feathers, they preen their wings, they duck their heads, they stretch out their necks, they pick up a twig and shake it in their bills. <clears throat> I watch this male displaying for over 25 minutes. One sultry afternoon on a high island um, in the bayou section of uh, southeastern Texas. The female visible behind him there in the foliage, I thought she looked totally unimpressed, but she must have been paying attention because she later on came out and mated with him. Great egrets and snowy egrets were the inspiration for the Migratory Bird Act <clears throat> and the National Audubon Society. Starting in the late um, 1800s, whoops, went too far there, sorry. Starting in the late 1800s, these beautiful birds were hunted almost to extinction to meet a demand for long, beautiful plumes in ladies' hats. It is estimated that the London millinery industry alone used feathers from well over 100,000 egrets per year. Plume hunters would often kill every single adult bird in a rookery, rookery of several thousand nests, and they'd leave the eggs and the nestlings to die. Well, two Boston socialites, Harriet Hemingway and Minna Hall, were horrified and revolted. And so they began a nationwide boycott of hat makers who used bird feathers of any kind. And they also invited other women to join them in a club that was going to protect birds. And that club became the nation's first Audubon Club. With additional support from ornithologist William Brewer, Brewster, excuse me, the group advocated for the, a law that became the Migratory Bird Act of 1913. This law banned market hunting and the interstate transport of birds. And I think everyone will remember that the previous administration in Washington really made a big attempt to gut the act entirely. Great blue herons, like egrets, show no obvious sexual dimorphism. All the adults are showy and they're all gorgeous. Males and females join in really elaborate pair bonding displays. They transfer sticks from one bill to the other. They greet each other with ritualized motions. They erect their plumes, those plumes on the top of their head, and they clap the tips of their bills together. Well, big showy birds like herons and egrets make themselves even more showy for courtship. And jungle forest birds rely on brilliant plumage to woo females. And northern forest birds rely on song. But what do birds of wide open spaces use? Well, most of them rely on flight, show off flight, daredevil flight, acrobatic flight, extravagant flight, exhausting flight. With no trees or mountains in the way, they can be seen from far away. And that's what they want. They want to be seen. There's a bird in our Great Plains. This uh, photo is from the web. And Canada's prairie province is called the Sprague's Pipit. Both males and females are sort of nondescript, little tan birds. But the males hold the world record for extended courtship flight. They take off into the wind. They go as much as 300 feet into the air. They hesitate. Then they glide to the ground singing the whole way. <clears throat> and when they get close to the surface of the waving grass, they just swoop right up again and repeat the whole thing over and over and over. One male's Sprague's pipit was observed displaying for three full hours without stopping before he plummeted to the ground, apparently exhausted. I was very lucky. I didn't get a picture of a Sprague's Pippet, but I saw a displaying Sprague's Pippet one day in Montana in a group led by David Sibley, the man that wrote the most popular field guide to North American birds. 
David's whole life has been dedicated to nature and particularly birds. He's seen thousands and thousands of birds. He's illustrated hundreds and hundreds of them. But even he was awed to see this plain looking little bird performing its courtship flight. And when the pipit finally stopped flying and singing, David shook himself and ran his hands up and down his arms and said, goosebumps. <laughs> and I think everybody, every one of us in the group agreed. Many hummingbirds also rely on courtship flight to attract females. The males of several Western species, <clears throat> including humming, uh, Anna's hummingbird, like this a little female on her expandable nest of cobweb, do really elaborate displays. They climb well over 100 feet in the air. They dive bomb toward their uh, perched female. And at the lowest part of the dive, the males quickly spread and close their tail feathers. And that makes a fluttering noise that that tiny bird doesn't make at any other time. And the faster the male hummingbird dives, the louder that fluttering sound is. We have only one kind of hummingbird that breeds here in Vermont, the ruby-throated. And they do a courtship display too. Um, when the male sees a female in his territory, he zooms about 50 feet above her. And then he makes a looping U-shaped dive back and forth and back and forth over her head. And if she perches, he gets really close and starts making really fast side-by-side -side flights while facing her. Some much bigger birds, like ospreys, also take to the air in dramatic flight displays when they're trying to attract a female. The birds used to be called fish hawks, and they do an appropriately named fish flight. A male will fly slowly and majestically back and forth over a nest site with legs dangling and a fish clutched in the talons of one foot. And this display can last as long as 10 minutes. Bald eagles perform shared or paired courtship flights, which I've never seen and would love to. A pair will fly high into the sky, lock their talons, and cartwheel down together, pulling out of the fall at the last second to avoid crashing into the ground. This pair of eagles, many people uh, here tonight have seen. This was the, is the pair that has nested um, on Hawkins Road and um, yeah, mm -hmm, down there <laughs> um, for, for three years now, I think, or four years. <clears throat> Studies have shown, by the way, that these elaborate or exhausting courtship flights are what's called honest advertising. Weaker males just can't perform the lengthy and energetic displays that the, that the stronger males can. So therefore, the dances give accurate information to females about the health and the overall fitness of prospective mates. Males who dance longer and more energetically will probably be better mates. And I just remember the name of the town. These are the Ferrisburg pair of eagles. So we'll stop here just for a few minutes if anyone has any questions. And if not, I will go immediately on to um, part two. And while we give some people time to ask questions, I would like to ask everybody to consider going to our link in the chat, which is for donations. Um, we would like to request that if you enjoyed this presentation and you enjoy our other presentations, that you consider a small donation as part of being able to have our presenters and also to be able to afford this to uh, you, the public. So we suggest a very nominal fee of two or five or $10. And uh, our program that we gave two weeks ago, we were quite, quite happy to and surprised pleasantly to see that people did step up and they donated. So. Again, we would like to uh, encourage you, it's right on our website. There's a button that says memberships and donation and our president Jeff Hallstrung has put it right into the chat. The chat is where the, you would uh, ask your questions to me. At this point, Mav, we do not have any questions that I can see. So it looks like we are ready for the birds and the bees in Birdland part two. Good, thank you. I, I have to... Um second what Tom said, 
Green Mountain Audubon Society has put together amazing programs for, for, well, they started putting them together before COVID, but what they've been doing with the um, um, Zooming since COVID has just gotten so many people involved. I hear people talking about uh, these programs. So definitely go to their website, click on events, and just look at what there is there. Everything has been um, recorded also. So if you click on um, resources, you can find all the recordings from previous um, programs. Last night, we sort of binged and watched two previous programs in a row, and, and it was wonderful. <clears throat> so we were talking about how birds, how the males and females of various kinds of birds differ and how they're the same to our eyes. And we talked about sexual dimorphism, the difference in appearance between males and females. And that can involve different sizes, different colors, different flying behaviors, different courtship behaviors. Male birds the world around make use of their plumage, their singing ability, their acrobatic ability, <laughs> and their stamina to attract and win female birds. <laughs> There's one small family of seabirds though, in which the whole process works backwards. And I always have to stop and think about how to pronounce this before I say this. When I was in high school, I read a book called Too Late the Philarapy. At least that was how I was sure it was pronounced. There was a student in our school named Penelope. So this had to be philarapy. And I pronounced these birds philarapy until, oh, I've been burning for years, decades. And then a phalarope showed up in a farm pond in Addison. And there were many other Vermont birders there enjoying it. And not one was saying philarapy. So now <laughs> I know <laughs> that they're called phalaropes. And they're slender birds that spend most of their lives way out to sea. They come to land only um, to nest. And they often forage, if, if that's the right word, by spinning quickly in place in the water. And they make these little whirlpools. And the whirlpools suck up tiny aquatic invertebrates, invertebrates such as shrimp. There are only three species of phalaropes living today. There apparently were more ages ago. And in all three, the slightly larger females have more brightly colored breeding plumage than the males. And it's the females who select, pursue, and fight over mates. And it's the females who defend their chosen mates against other females. Males do all of the incubation and all of the caring for chicks. And the females go off and look for another mate and then lay a second clutch of eggs for the new mate to raise. And when it gets too late in the season to start a new nest, the females just leave. They just start migrating southward and they leave the males behind to finish the jobs of incubation and care of the young. Phalaropes, I call them seabirds, but they belong to the shorebird family. That's a gigantic family. <clears throat> and it, that family shows a huge range of possibilities when it comes to male and female differences. In some species, the males are much larger. In others, the females are much larger. A female spotted sandpiper like this will be much bigger than her mate. And like a female phalarope, she might have several mates at one time, incubating her eggs on several different nests. Well, in many birds that are common in backyards, gender differences are there. That is, sexual dimorphism does exist but it's not as noticeable as in phalaropes or ducks or, or our gorgeous cardinals. Male and female hairy woodpeckers look very similar, except the females <clears throat> don't have a red splotch on the back of the head, <clears throat> and the males do. And the slightly smaller downy woodpecker has that same pattern. Female with no red splotch, male with. And notice that the two female woodpeckers I just showed you, the male and the uh, hairy and the downy, have black and white plumage. They're not camouflaged at all, like many of the females we saw at the beginning. And that's because they're cavity nesters. 
they don't need that mostly brown plumage that provides such great camouflage for birds that nest in trees or bush, bushes or grasses. In some species that we're all pretty used to, there is sexual dimorphism, but it's much more subtle. Um, male robins are slightly darker in color than females. The females often have grayer heads that contrast well with their dark bodies. We humans often don't even notice that, particularly if we just glance at a robin. Female white-breasted nuthatches um, can have slate gray on the top of their head instead of the black the males have. I love this photo of the nonchalantly upside down <laughs> Um, nuthatch. She's just hanging on, no difficulty at all, while she uh, contemplates, or he, could have been a he, uh, grabbing another peanut. This photo, like so many others in this program, uh, was taken by my partner Bernie Paquette. If other birders uh, gave me permission to use their pictures, um, their names do accompany the photos, as you've noticed. <clears throat> We've seen a lot of species in which the males and the females have different colors or different sizes or both, but that is not the norm in the avian world. In a large percentage of birds, whoops, I forgot I had another one of these little beauties in here. In a large percentage of birds, the males and the females, the mommy birds and daddy birds, as my daughter said, look alike to us humans, every single chickadee looks black and white and soft and really cute. Male and female tufted titmice, they're all gray and white and soft and really cute with those huge eyes. Morning doves, the males and females look alike to us. All adult blue jays look similar. The males and females are the same size, and they have the same color pattern. And other kinds of jays also, <clears throat> like this Canada jay, and their relatives, crows and ravens, they also show an apparent absence of, whoops, don't know what happened to my crow or raven. There he is, um, of sexual dimorphism. So for many, many years, it was believed that the sexes look alike and about three-fourths of the world's songbirds, and almost, I forgot the number for the world's birds totally. But most recently, however, scientists have discovered that this apparent sameness isn't real. It might be what we humans see, but it's not what birds see. We see a flock of cedar waxwings, beautiful, gorgeous, striking, handsome, fairly uniform, but in an article in Bird Watching Magazine, a researcher named Adam Marcus wrote, to avian eyes, a team of waxwings is as different as quarterbacks and cheerleaders. Well, how can this be? How can a group of waxwings look nearly identical to us, but look wildly different to each other? Well, ever since the work of Charles Darwin, Birds' plumage has been a major focus for studies of sexual selection. Plumage colors have been assessed and quantified according to human standards. And that doesn't make a lot of sense because humans are not the intended receivers for all the signals that are being sent out by bird color. But it's all, our own senses were all we had to go on. But now with more research, we know that birds don't see what we do. <clears throat> Humans detect light at long, medium, and short wavelengths, giving us what's called trichromatic vision. Our eyes filter out other wavelengths, uh, presumably to, to prevent damage. But a lot of birds have what's called tetrachromatic vision. They see light at long and medium and short wavelengths, like we do, but they can also see light in the near ultraviolet range. In other words, humans can see colors only from red to violet. Many, perhaps most songbirds also see at the ultraviolet end of the spectrum. When chickadees look at another chickadee using far more sensitive eyes than we have, 
they immediately see that the males show a much greater contrast between black and white and have much larger bibs than the females. This evidence is evident, this difference rather, is evident to us humans only if the birds are seen under ultraviolet light. Well, that UV reflection can either be a turn on to female birds or it actually can be a turn off. Female European starlings, which as we know are common all over the US despite their name, um, seem to pref prefer males that have less UV plumage coloring. But either way, whether females like lots of bright UV visible coloring or prefer just, just a sousson, there appears to be a significant correlation between UV reflectance, courtship displays, and mating success, an association we humans didn't even guess until fairly recently. <clears throat> well, seeing a wider band of colors than we humans can see means that birds truly inhabit a different visual world than we do. There's a big patch of marsh marigolds um, in a wet part of our yard. These are common plants. Um, they're also called uh, cow slips or cow parsley. And they're butter yellow. The flowers are butter yellow to us. <laughs> but here's a common marsh marigold flower under UV light. I like to imagine what our little swampy area looks like in the spring to hummingbirds flying over. When they look down at a carpet of hundreds and hundreds of flowers that scintillate and glow in all different colors like this. <clears throat> There's even another difference between how we see and how birds see. Fluorescent or luminescent materials glow and some birds glow. We humans can see fluorescence or luminescence under black light, but apparently many birds can see it anytime it's around. We know what Atlantic puffins look like in breeding plumage. The males are famous for those giant colorful beaks, black and charcoal gray and bright red and yellow and orange. <laughs> but when we look at a puffin, we're only seeing part of the beauty that's really there. Because during mating season, the beaks of Atlantic puffins are fluorescent. A lot of owl species have fluorescent wings even though we poor humans see just brown and gray. Under black light, newer, younger feathers glow brightly and older, more worn feathers appear a bit darker, a bit duller. Many people who capture and band owls sometimes turn a, a, on a black light and then they can enjoy glowing raspberry pink or navy blue or bright lavender on the bird's wings. In a fascinating bit of evolutionary logic, some hawks see light only in the same parts of the spectrum that we humans do. So when a male songbird is strutting his stuff to attract a female, the gloriously glowing parts of his plumage don't grab the attention of a nearby hungry raptor. Birds do it. Bees do it, even educated fleas do it. Males and females finding each other is a main theme in songs and romantic novels and movies and poems. Males and females getting together and making new creature, creatures is the very stuff of evolution, the very stuff of the continuation of life on earth. Willets like these are large shorebirds. Their wonderful cry is the background soundtrack to any spring visit to Plum Island, Massachusetts. You hear them all over, wee willet, wee willet, wee willet. Here's a pair of willets making more willets. Once bonded, this pair will probably stay together for several years, possibly for life. That kind of pair loyalty isn't all that common among birds. But here's another species that does mate for life. With bonded pairs sticking together, not just during breeding season, but all year round. Black vultures are industrious and attentive parents. They feed their young in the nest for 60 days and often continue to feed fledglings for several more months. 
We don't often see black vultures in Vermont, by the way, but a few show up every year, um, usually along with some turkey vultures. Now, piping plovers, going from large bird to a much smaller bird, are uh, on the federal list of endangered species. So it was particularly satisfying for a group of Vermont birders who went down to um, Plum Island a few years ago to see them working to add to the population. These adorable little birds are usually monogamous for one breeding season only, and then they change mates the following year, usually. Piping plovers nest right on the beach. When a male's courting, he tosses pebbles and bits of shell aside, and, and then he kicks them away, and he makes a little depression. And then he tilts his body forward, and he spreads his wings, and he fans his tail, and he high steps around the female. And if she accepts him, mating takes place. For most birds, mating itself takes a second or two. There are just too many predators around. And two birds totally focused on mating make an easy target. But to make up for that, most small birds mate many, many times a day, hundreds of times during the breeding season, increasing the chances for each one of them that his or her DNA will be successfully passed on to a new generation. For the vast majority of bird species, mating doesn't involve any penetration as it does with mammals. It doesn't even involve organs that are specifically for copulation or reproduction. Both the male and female birds have openings called cloacas, and they're both sexual and excretory openings. And during mating, the male and the female birds press their cloacas together and sperm is passed. Copulations lasting one to three seconds and they go on a hundred times a day. Ducks are the one exception I know of. Um, I, I haven't researched geese, so I don't know about that. But males and females do have organs that are specifically for reproduction like mammals do although they're shaped very differently from mammal equivalents. Um, both sexes have spiral or corkshoe sexual organs. And duck copulation, unlike that of many birds, lasts many minutes. And when it takes place in the water, it sometimes actually results in the drowning death of a female. Well, even if we don't see courtship behavior or mating, it's fun for us humans to be able to recognize male and female birds when we see them. Being attentive to sexual differences and sexual samenesses in birds, being alert to signs of courtship and mate selection, help us know more about the creatures that we're watching, the creatures we love, <laughs> help us know more about their daily lives. And it helps us to start looking for behaviors that are unique to males and females. Let's just briefly recap some facts about mommy birds and daddy birds. There appear to be four options when we're considering differences and similarities between males and females. Option one is no difference that we humans can see. In most New World sparrows, like all of those on this page, males and females look identical to us. And we couldn't tell if this adorable little Carolina wren that came to our feeders for several months in the winter was a male or a female. Both sexes of catbird, gray catbirds, are gray, with a darker color on the top of their heads and rusty or cinnamon color under the tail. And during breeding season, every single co adult common loon is dramatic black and white, has a huge bill, and has that striped choker or necklace. Every adult Canada goose looks to us like every other adult Canada goose. So that's one option. We can't see any difference. Here's option two. <clears throat> the species have, some species have relatively small differences in plumage that can help us distinguish between males and females. And woodpeckers are a great example. Female pileateds or pileateds have a black cheek stripe and the males have a red cheek stripe. We have several species of swallows here in the Northeast, 
and some do show sexual dimorphism. Others, like these tree swallows, sort of do. Some females are almost indistinguishable from the glossy blue, green, and white males, while others have quite a lot of brown on them with varying hints and amounts of blue-green. The third option, some species have gender differences that are instantly clear, instantly clear to another of their own species, but not to us. In some cases, like most hawks, falcons, and, owl, and uh, well, almost all raptors, it's a matter of relative size. The females are larger than males, <coughs> in um, most of those species. And in other cases like chickadees, we would need to see the birds under special kind of lighting. Option four is when the color differences between males and females are immediately obvious, even to humans, even with our relatively limited visual abilities. This young male indigo bunting will be mostly indigo colored when he's fully mature. His mate, will be almost all brown. Male dark-eyed juncos, goodness gracious, I think I mentioned before I have a brand new computer and a brand new mouse, and the mouse is extremely sensitive. <clears throat> Male dark-eyed juncos, most of them, are slate gray with white bellies. And we can usually pick out the females because they have varying amounts of brown mixed in with the dark plumage. But the reason I said most males look like that and usually pick up the females is juncos have an astonishing range of individual differences, differences that are just true for that one bird. At our feeders, we've had dramatically black and white juncos, gray and white juncos, brown and white juncos, extremely pale gray juncos, juncos with bits of white on their wings, and even juncos that are all mottled. <laughs> and splotchy like this one. Evening grosbeaks, beautiful birds that I haven't seen here for two years now, have much less individual variation than juncos do. And they leave no doubt as to whether they're male or female. The females wear muted tan and lemon yellow, very, very pretty colors. And the males flaunt brilliant white, bright yellow and black. So finally, in our recap, birds make use of their specially colored plumage in courtship displays that can range from simple to extravagant. And they also use colored plumage to recognize other males. In other words, to recognize competition. This is particularly true in the large family of little birds called warblers. The black mask on the beautiful little common yellow throat, the bottom right picture there, is a signal. If there's a mask, the bird is a male and therefore a potential rival. Some researchers did a test recently where they had a stuffed female yellow throat and they put a black mask on it. And males attacked it. Roundup. They'll be able to do that while this winter seems to be dragging on. <clears throat> or if you're just sitting in your backyard or looking through your window, <clears throat> as you enjoy the birds that you see coming to your feeders, as you look through nature magazines or leaf through your birding field guides. Enjoy the dramatically different, the dramatic differences in sexual dimorphic species, but also look for more subtle differences in other species. And then try to imagine how much more gorgeous some of those males would look if you were another bird. Thank you so much. Mav, I want to thank you. Uh, I thought that was fascinating. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to flip a switch and to go on to TetraVision and see what's really happening? For all those who join us tonight, I'd like to point out a few upcoming programs. 
On February 3rd, we have Doug Morin, who's a wildlife biologist. He's gonna be giving us a presentation about bird conservation in Vermont, bird species and habitat conservation across Vermont. And again, that is Thursday, February 3rd. Mav is gonna come back again, third part of her series, Thursday, February 24th. And she's gonna talk about bird nests, custom designed and custom built for the growing family with Mav Kim. And we have other programs. Again, we'd like to thank you this evening for joining us, the Green Mountain Audubon Society. Thank you, Matt, for the kind words. All of our previous programs are available on a YouTube channel, and that link is available on greenmountainaudubon.org. Again, we'd like to direct your attention to that site and ask you to kindly consider making a small donation. Having said that, it is now 729. Mav, thank you. Our hats are off to you. Well, my hat is now off to you. And we will <laughs> see you soon. And we will see all of you when the weather warms up and we get out birding again. Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>